So they said Kemp is being the president next. All right. Good afternoon. I want to welcome you that are here in class and also those of you who are online. Um, this is our third class in the from populism from prohibition to populism, how politics are in our DNA. Well, the first week we looked at an overall perspective of, of um, Kansas and some of the movements that have come from this state. Um, last week, we had Tom Giesel, who talked about the role of the farmer and um, the populism movement as it sprang forth in Kansas. This week, I wanted to look at our role in public health. And um, I had originally scheduled um, Christy Zukovich from the Kansas Public Health Foundation. And she had, um, unfortunately, one of the founding members of the Kansas Health Foundation died this past week. And so they were, uh, all the people there, were pretty much consumed with trying to um, take care of that and honor him and, and those kind of things. Um, and so I have to admit, I did a Hail Mary. And I was very, very fortunate. I think you will be pleased with who I was able to, to snag for today. And uh, I'll get to introducing them in a second. I have a little housekeeping I need to do first. And that is a request for those of you who are in person, uh, please turn off your cell phones or at least put them on silent mode um, during this class. And for those of you who have questions, um, for those of you online, if you have any questions, please email them to us at lifelonglearning at Wichita edu. Um, so please do that. And we have, for those of you who are in person in this class, we have a microphone over to my side here. And so please, if you have questions, feel free to walk up to the mic and ask your questions or make a comment. Um, we have, there's a blue uh, painter's tape X on the floor. So if you can stand on that and ask your questions, that would be perfect. Um, we'll take a break at two o'clock and um, it'll probably be no more than like five or 10 minutes at the most. And also that per the latest university guideline, instructors presenting on stage do not need to wear a mask or a face covering, but it is requested that students and visitors alike must wear face coverings over their mouths and noses while on all WSU campus buildings, in all hallways, public sp spaces, classrooms, and other common areas of um, the the campus. Um, again, I am so thrilled um, to have these two folks with us this afternoon. Um, Carrie Herman um, is going to be presenting a story on Dr. Arthur Hertzler, the famous horse and buggy doctor of Halstead. He became known throughout the world for his excellence in pathology, his love of children, his concern for health education of the general public. And so the Kansas Learning Center for Health was in Halstead was founded by his late widow as a memorial in his honor. Carrie uh, Herman um, is the executive director in Newton at the Kansas Learning Center for Health, so please forgive me. Um, she became the director in July of 2016. Uh, prior to that, she was almost nine years at Asbury Park in Newton. Uh, she is the past president of the Newton Lions Club, vice president of the PEO, Chapter AK, and the past chairman of the Central Kansas Community Foundation. And then we also have Donald, uh, Dr. Donald Decker, a retired cardiologist who uh, is known as the father and founder 
of the Halstead Hospital Intensive Care Unit. Um, it was established in 1969 and dedicated to him in 1995. He has served on the Kansas Learning Center for Health Board of Trustees for over 50 years. Please join me in welcoming these two individuals. Hello. Hello. I'm going to move the computer for a minute just so you guys can see Dr. Decker. So there's Dr. Decker. We see him. Hello, doctor. Hello. Glad to be here. All right. So Becky, you want us to try and be done by one and, and then will we have Q and A after that? It's a little past one right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> if, you, if we could take a break around two, it doesn't have to be right on the nose, but okay. somewhere around that. And then if you could be available for mm -hmm. any questions and answers okay. um, that the class may have, I think that would work perfectly. Great. And okay. thank you again. You're welcome. A lot. You're welcome. I know we're going to be talking a little bit on a different subject than, than what you had planned. So we do thank you for inviting us to share our story and how we got started um, and the background of Dr. Hertzler. So I'll just jump in and get started. I will say it's kind of weird to be giving a presentation without seeing my audience. So um, it, it'll be different for both Dr. Decker and I to do that. So today, you know, as Becky mentioned, we're going to be talking about Dr. Arthur Hertzler, who has been known as the horse and buggy doctor, um, the fame of the Hertzler Clinic and Halstead Hospital, and then how the Kansas Learning Center for Health was brought into existence. And that all began when Dr. Hertzler came to Halstead in 1895. And a lot of people wonder why he came here. Well, he came to help. Um, he was living in Mound Ridge, and we had a tornado come through on May 1st, 1895. And he wanted to come and help with that. And so here's a photo of the aftermath of that tornado. And then he decided that he liked it so much, he went ahead and decided to stay here and practice medicine. And here's a picture of him as a very young man back in 1897. And then here's another one of him kind of a little bit younger age. Um, and then when he was 76, uh, Dr. Hertzler was born July 26, 1870 in West Point, Iowa. He passed away September 12, 1946 here in Halstead. Um, he's very striking in appearance uh, as well as his mind. He was a very tall, gangly man. He was six feet, two and a half inches tall. He had stooped shoulders, peering eyes, and had an appearance that reminded most of Lincoln. Those who knew Dr. Hertzler best regarded him as a very sensitive man. Although often appearing gruff and tactless, he was at the same time easily offended. To his friends, close associates, students, and patients, he was regarded as a person of utmost kindness. He was generous to a fault and was always willing to give of himself whenever the need arose. But at the same time, he was well aware of his own abilities, and this, coupled with his competitive and outspoken nature, often made him enemies. He could be very blunt and tart with his fellow physicians, and when he had to fire a doctor, he would just simply change the locks on the doctor's door and then leave the belongings and their final check on the table in the corridor. In general, Dr. Hertzler had strong likes and dislikes, and if he didn't like you, it was off with your head, but if he did like you, nobody could be more charming, kind, or sympathetic than him. And I have kind of a rundown here of, of his education. As you can see, he received several degrees starting at Southwestern College in Winfield, um, went on and went to school at Northwestern in Chicago. Uh, he did some postgraduate study at the University of Berlin. Um, and when he was in Berlin, um, he studied under, I always say their name wrong, Ber Berkow? Berkow. Berkow. So he studied under Berkow between 1899 and 1901. He also held several honorary degrees from Washburn University, Southwestern University, Boston University, and even Bethel College. And the picture here is him when he graduated from medical school in 1894. Um, as I mentioned, he did receive his um, degree from Southwestern College in Winfield back in 1896. And in the fall of 2016, 
uh, Southwestern College inducted him into their Hall of Fame, um, had some of his family come from out of state to get presented an award, and then they left us with the award to have here on, on site. And this is a picture um, that they have in their Hall of Fame. From 1901 to 1907, he taught surgery and pathology at the University Medical College of Kansas City, which now is known as the University of Kansas School of Medicine. In 1907, he became a professor of surgery and pathology at the University of Kansas School of Medicine. And that's he did remain on staff there until his death in 1946. As a professor, um, Dr. Herzler was immensely popular with his students. His lectures crackled with his ready wit, and although his coverage of the formal lecture material could oftentimes be haphazard and often less than inspiring, but he refused to give exams or to grade them when they were given. And on at least one occasion, he took the entire class to a baseball game in lieu of a final examination. He felt that any teacher worth his salt should know how his students were progressing without formal testing. It's unclear what the dean of the school thought about that practice. <laughs> um, he gave every graduating senior a complete set of his monographs on surgical pathology when they graduated. Um, Dr. Hertzler also taught at the Kansas City General Hospital, um, and he became known as the greatest surgical pathologist that ever lived. He knew what he was doing and what he intended to do, and he did it. Fear wasn't in him. Be sure you're right, then go ahead might have been his motto if he'd had one. That was the guiding principle of his life. On June 17th in 1902, um, Dr. Herzler opened health facilities in a two and a half story wooden building, which contained five rooms for surgical patients on the second floor and five rooms on the third floor for medical patients. The first floor contained a kitchen, dining room, bathroom, operating room, and bedrooms. The patients that were too sick to climb the stairs were carried up. This initial building was very impressive by 1902 standards, especially when characterized by rural practice via horse and buggy. The surgery room even featured a tile floor and was Dr. Hertzler's pride and joy. With the continued growth of his practice, he incorporated his hospital in 1913. To permit Dr. Hertzler to continue teaching in Kansas City and still provide the best possible medical care for his patients, the Hertzler Clinic was organized in 1915. So this little hospital bumped along for several years, but nearly went under when its founder had a series of illnesses. However, the Mennonites were able to come to his aid, and by 1915, Dr. Hertzler was able to enlarge the east end of the main building, and in 1916, he remodeled the hospital, stuccoing it and fireproofing it. He installed double operating doors on the second floor, um, and he left the old one to be used as a little operating room. Um, and that also had the diagnostic x-ray equipment adjoining it. And then in 1905, Dr. Hertzler organized a training school for nurses operating in conjunction with the hospital until 1966. In 1909, the first nurse, Ada Pleasant Schmidtware, graduated from the School of Nursing. Licensing and state board examinations began in 1913. Dr. Hertzler, known as grandpa to these students, gave each graduate $10 for the state board examination fee. Later, he gave each $50 a thermometer, a medicine glass, and a medical dictionary. Dr. Hertzler liked to keep in touch with his girls, or grandpa's girls, as he called them. In 1919, a nurse's dormitory was added to the medical complex. Prior to this time, they were being boarded in private homes. The last nursing class was in 1966. In its six decades of existence, the Halstead Hospital School of Nursing graduated 977 nurses. Pictures of the, the different graduating classes now reside. We have some here at the Kansas Learning Center for Health, and then the majority of them are at the Halstead Heritage Museum and Train Depot. After a series of improvements, the hospital and clinic became known as a major medical center by the late 1920s and early 1930s. Dr. Hertzler recognized the relationship between mental and physical illness early on. As a result, Halstead Hospital was the first general hospital west of the Allegheny Mountains to have a full-time psychiatrist on its staff, and that was in 1926. He was a busy, hardworking man. His day most often entailed working from 5 a.m. to 6 p.m., 
he'd sleep for a few hours between nine and maybe one or two in the morning, and then he would get up and write. Dr. Hertzler conducted operations seven days a week. He seldom did less than four major operations a day, and typically he would do seven or eight. Neither he nor the hospital refused a patient due to the inability to pay. From Dr. Hertzler's very first day of practice, all surgical specimens and tumors were saved, sectioned, stained, and studied for a total of 150,000 slides. It's been said that while other physicians were busy acquiring automobiles, Dr. Hertzler bought books and collected tumors. Dr. Hertzler had an interest in anesthesia, a technique that he did introduce to, the, to our country. He did his earliest experiments by operating on himself, his arm, leg, and neck, and he used cocaine as the anesthetic. His introduction of local anesthesia was major to American medicine. It resulted in less cardiac arrest episodes and less patients choking. He often performed thyroidectomies in less than 15 minutes. As remarkable as Hertzler's surgical speed was his simplicity. Dr. Vic Chesky, who is his chief assistant here in Holstead, recalled that he used fewer instruments than any surgeon he had ever known. Once he was known to have performed an appendectomy with only a scalpel, two hemostats, scissors, and a needle holder. Hertzler was remarkable as well for the versatility of his surgical ability. He did not hesitate to operate on any part of the body and his repertoire included practically the entire range of surgery then known. In this work, he came to rely on his trusted associate, Dr. Victor Chesky. Later in life, he wrote, I never feared any operation and do not now, but somehow when confronted by a difficult operation, I like to see my old time tried assistant of more than 20 years at my side. And if you notice in this picture, Dr. Hertzer can be seen operating without a mask on which seems unimaginable right now when we're all wearing masks every day. So, uh, Dr. Hertzler was married three times and divorced twice. He had three daughters with his first wife, Myrtle Arnold, um, whom he married in 1894. His three daughters were Agnes Hancock Hebert, Helen Lenore Hebert, and Margaret Lois Brown. In the picture is Dr. Hertzler with his mother and his daughter, daughter Agnes, and then her twin sons, Dean and Dan Hebert. Dr. Hertzler's last book, subtitled The Scientific Inquiry into Influences Which Harm the Child, was dedicated to this beloved daughter, Agnes. She was his firstborn, a graduate in medicine who became, became an ophthalmologist to the Hertzler Clinic and who died of an embolism following a gallbladder operation in 1925, which he performed. This death of his daughter, Agnes, was his greatest grief in life. And as he often said, the only antidote for grief is work and work he did, and then more work. The last words of his philosophical thesis are, guided by the love of a child, only can a new world be built. Agnes had been the light of Hertzler's life and had followed in his footsteps, obtaining a medical degree at Kansas in 1920. She was practicing with him at the clinic in Holstead at the time of her death. It was said that Hertzler never fully recovered from this loss. He even painted a room black in the basement of the clinic and went there every day to mourn her for the rest of his life. In this picture, you'll notice Agnes's photo um, in the background above his desk. And this is a picture that we also have here in our conference room. The North Annex was added onto the hospital and the first elevator was installed in 1925. And beginning with a single assistant, um, first Dr. Hensberger, then Dr. Sutton, Wetke, Gibson, Billingham, and Dewar, uh, Dr. Chesky coming in 1916. Uh, his staff was augmented from time to time, ranging between 12 and 21 members. And this is a picture of his staff um, back in 1926. Dr. Hertzler established one of the most competent staff known. He surrounded himself with competent physicians that had diverse specialties. During the summer, medical students would spend time at Halstead Hospital, and they were often referred to as Cubs. Here's a picture of them in the summer of 1927. 
By 1926, the beds were overflowing, and the new Agnes Hertzler Memorial Clinic Edition was built in memory of Dr. Hertzler's deceased daughter, Agnes. By 1929, a fourth floor was added to the dormitory in the North Connection Building in 1930. In 1930, the hospital was completed as a quadrangle boasting over 200 beds and a dormitory for 100 nursing students. If placed end-to-end, -end, the buildings would measure 576 feet. The hospital was supported by patients who would flock to Halstead from all over the United States due to Dr. Hertzler's growing reputation as a renowned surgeon and pathologist. Dr. Hertzler never turned a patient away. He had a simple procedure of making a very low charge for surgery. The maximum was $150. The daily room rate at the hospital was never more than $4 per day. Widows, war veterans, the clergy, and their families received not only free medical and surgical services, but free medicine as well. Dr. Hertzler was known by most as the horse and buggy doctor. Um, however, he was known as the chief to his associates, paw to hordes of medical students, and grandpa to his nurses and children. When the publication of his autobiography, Horse and Buggy Doctor, in 1938, and its selection as a Book of the Month Club, it assured Dr. Hertzler's rise to national recognition. It was immediately a bestseller. It swept the country and before long the world. Within a year, over 200,000 copies had been sold. The book was even adapted for a radio play on Hallmark Playhouse with Lionel Barrymore portraying the doctor. It must have been, it must have astonished him and he was as far from being a seeker after publicity as was to be expected with his Mennonite background and his devotion to work. Dr. Hertzler's chief diversion from his um, medical work was shooting. And for several years around 1930, he was the national champion of the U.S. Revolver Association. His interest in guns began in his youth when he acquired a small muzzle-loading pistol. And during his horse and buggy days, he made his country rounds armed with his Colt Peacemaker, which he fired to just, just to pass the time. His collection of guns eventually numbered 150 rifles and 110 handguns, which he fired often spending an hour or so at practice almost every evening. Each year, he was awarded a handgun as a prize to the winner of the Kansas Peace Officers Association yearly shoot. After breaking his ankle in, in 1929, he disposed of most of his collection. However, his interest didn't change. It was often observed that if a patient came in and talked to guns with Dr. Herzler, his card was certain to say no charge. The house pictured here was Dr. Hertzler's comfortable and generous country home that he called the Crow's Nest. In it, among many things, were thousands of books and a fine collection of guns, since he was such an expert marksman. He had a pistol range inside his house as well as outside. He would often have pistol shoots with law officers with a big dinner following. Dr. Hertzler was very supportive of law enforcement and was named the honorary police chief of both Newton and Hutchison and an honorary police commissioner of Harvey County. He even gave the Hutchison Police Department a special camera for mugging prisoners. Dr. Hertzler's sleeping arrangement at the Crow's Nest was very unconventional. He enjoyed the railroad sleepers so much that he built one in his home with a single bed built long enough for his long frame and a curtain that pulled shut once he was in bed. One of our um, Kansas Learning Center for Health board members shared a story with us about his experience at the Crow's Nest when he was younger. Um, he and Vic Chesky, they were told never to go into a particular building out there, but they were never told why. Um, so, of course, when you have two very curious high school kids that pass that shed twice a day, they're going to wonder what's in there. One day, they dared one another to open the door. When they opened the door, they saw a large tank in the middle of the room with a cover over it. When they flipped back the tarp, they saw a cadaver that Dr. Hertzler had partially dissected. They immediately put the cover back on, ran to the door, and they never went back in there again. And I cannot blame them. <laughs> so during his lifetime, Dr. Hertzler published more than 150 medical articles and 25 books. And these pictures are from him back in 1934 and in 1938 um, at his desk writing.
Dr. Hertzler's love of books was legendary. When he joined the faculty of the University of Kansas School of Medicine, he brought with him a 10,000 volume library. In 1922, he donated another 8,000 volumes while maintaining a huge library in Holstead. This amazing collection was considered to be the best private collection in the state, if not in the entire Midwest. Dr. Hertzler's philanthropy Philanthropy, sorry, and his love for children were well known. He was generous in his support of projects that helped children. To the children at the children's home in Newton, he was known as Grandpa, and a very indulging one at that. Um, he would take ice cream every Sunday and holiday, and then lollipops almost daily. At one point, he even played Santa at Christmas time and distributed gifts to everyone. He gave of his time, influence, and money to further the Boy Scouts and even helped lay stones for the new scout cabin in the park west of the hospital, which still is in um, existence today. Dr. Hertzler is shown here um, in that upper left-hand picture with two of his milk route children back in the 1930s. He didn't smile in many photos, but you can really see his love for children um, shine on his face in this picture. It's very one of the very rare pictures we have of him smiling. And then this bottom picture is of him with his twin grandsons, Dan and Dean Hebert. By the 1930s, Dr. Hertzler felt he'd had enough, busy with his own practice, being an author, researcher, speaker, and instructor, so he decided to sell the hospital. It's also been said that Dr. Hertzler was going to have to start paying taxes. So in order for the hospital to retain a nonprofit status, he sold it to the Sisters of St. Joseph on April 20th, 1933 for $1. He retained the clinic as his own and the two institutions operated as separate but interdependent institutions. This existing hospital continued serving patients until the 1970s. The number of patients hospitalized grew quite a bit. In 1903, there was 34. And then when you look at 1953 numbers, 4,876. And then in 1973, um, the number of patients in the hospital was 6,839. Dr. Hertzler and Dr. Irene Kinnicky were married June 8, 1935. She was 27 years younger than him. And shown here are some pictures of her um, when she was young, kind of in middle age, and then later in life. And she really was the driving force to keep Dr. Hertzler's legacy going. And her life story is entirely different. And it can be shared and read about in this book called The Hertzler Heritage that's written by Edith C. Coe. It was written in 1975. And it talks about the history of the Kansas Learning Center for Health and how it came into existence. Dr. Hertzler loved baseball. So much so that in the spring of 1941, he hired the Chicago Cubs to play an exhibition game against the best team there was in Wichita, out in the pasture at the Crow's Nest. Several hundred from Halstead attended the game. The Chicago Cubs sent him a thank you letter as shown, and it reads, Dear Doctor, speaking of stakes, and I assure you, Doctor, that the entire party of Cubs, players, manager, Coaches, trainer, and the newspapermen still are speaking of stakes. I want to express, express thanks of all of us for your stalking the dining car at Wichita, Kansas, one memorable day in April. Those, doctor, were stakes. I hope this informal letter will serve to express the sentiments and the thanks of all of the Chicago Cubs towards their good friend and better provider, Dr. Hertzler and it was signed by all of the Chicago Cubs. Through the combined efforts of Dr. Irene Kinnicky and Mrs. Um, Victor Chesky and the Sisters of St. Joseph, they held a surprise celebration at Holstead Hospital on August 16, 1941, and it was to honor Dr. Hertzler and Dr. Chesky for their 25 years that they had been working together. 50 doctors and their families were present for this momentous occasion. And in the center is where um, Dr. Hertzler and Dr. Kinnicky are. And then here's a picture of the two honorees at the celebration. Mm -hmm. 
I love this. These photos of him are so neat. Um, to say that Dr. Hertzler's students adored him really is an understatement. At the time of the doctor's retirement from medical school, the students gave their salute to the horse and buggy doctor in the 1944 Jay Hawker. And it is as written. Now here's a man who needs no introduction, for many have sat at his feet for instruction. To Kansans, he's known as their prominent surgeon. When it comes to driving, he never needs urgent. To seniors, he's generous with pictures and books and says, God or the devil has given me my looks. The personal message to each he did try for, for however, that scrawl of his we can't decipher. His nose is a masterpiece long and so thin. His fingers in many a belly have been. But the thyroid's his pet and he keeps every one. We've pictured his books to show what he's done. He will never die but to heaven arise. To us it would be no surprise if St. Peter would run with a wide open bottle or wide open throttle to keep his own thyroid out of Pa's bottle. So kind of a funny little sentiment to him that they wrote. In April of 1944, Herzler was made Professor Emeritus of Surgery at the Kansas University School of Medicine, and in 1946, he began to look forward to an active retirement. On February 26, 1946, he officially retired with the following notification to his nurses. My dear girls, old grandpa has retired. 52 years, seven days a week is all I had. Henceforth, I will keep house for Doc and bathe the dog. I may plant some onions and beans. Well, few beans were to be planted, however, for on Thursday, September 12, 1946, Arthur Emanuel Hertzler died at the age of 76. Mm -hmm. Dr. Chesky reported that his death was due to heart failure and uremia. Within 24 hours of death, they elected Dr. Vic Chesky to become the chief of the hospital, a position he held until he passed away in the summer of 1962. So when Dr. Hertzler died on September 12th of 46, ownership of the clinic passed on to a partnership of these five physicians. Um, these five were largely responsible for the clinic's continued growth and progress. And it included Dr. Irene Kinnicky, which was Dr. Hertzler's widow, Dr. Vic Chesky, um, one of our surgeons, Dr. Tom Foster, a psychiatrist, um, Dr. Peckin Schneider with internal medicine, and then Dr. G.A. Westfall Sr., an internal medicine specialist. The clinic, the clinic operated as a partnership until 1955 when the physicians formed an association. The wise guidance and professional expertise of these five physicians who carried Dr. Hertzler's vision into the future assured the continued growth of the clinic and the hospital, which became known as the Little Mayo of the Midwest. They continue to recruit top-notch specialists in a variety of fields. In April of 1947, the new school and nursing build building located across the street from the hospital and clinic was formally opened. The building contained classrooms, laboratories, kitchens, library, and living quarters for the sisters, as well as a chapel and auditorium that seated about 300. The building was incorporated into the new hospital construction of the 1970s. To honor Dr. Hertzler's memory as a teacher, researcher, surgeon, and pathologist, the Hertzler Research Foundation was organized and incorporated in March of 1948. The committee included Dr. Irene Kinnicky, Dr. Vic Chesky, Dr. Foster, and Mr. Hampson. Three principal focal points were to be medical research, the medical library, and a yet-to-be-determined facility, facility which would embody Dr. Hertzler's interest in children and youth. That facility was later opened in 1965 as the Kansas Health Museum. Here's an aerial view of the hospital in either the 50s or the 60s. And in 1952, as a tribute to Dr. Hertzler during the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the hospital, um, Dr. Karuki of Mount Vernon, New York, he was a colleague of Dr. Hertzler's, and he said the following, Pioneers like Dr. Arthur E. Hertzler are never adequately replaced when they pass on. They are seldom, if ever, properly recognized and honored when living. You will have success in your present endeavor as long as you keep the spirit of the leader, Dr. Hertzler, before you. 
So the spirit lives on today through the Kansas Learning Center for Health, which was formerly the Kansas Health Museum. Another $2 million project was finished in 1960. In 1969, the hospital added a new seven bed intensive care unit, one of the first referral centers to do so. In the Kansas City Star on May 10th, 1958, Dr. Irene Kinnicky read about a health museum opening in Hinsdale, Illinois. And she thought if Hinsdale can do it, why not Halstead? This may well be the answer for which, for which we've been searching. Perhaps this can be the phase three for the Herzl Research Foundation. A health museum would indeed be a suitable memorial to Dr. Herzler. It would incorporate and coordinate his interest in children and education with the principle of visual education. So Irene presented the idea of a health museum to the board of the Herzl Research Foundation in December of 1958. The group with Dr. Chesky serving as president was interested in the idea and asked Irene to visit Hinsdale and report her impressions. Irene went to Hinsdale in February of 59, and at the museum she met Belita, a transparent talking lady. And upon her return, a recommendation was made that the doctors who could visit Chicago and see the museum do so, and seven of them did, all favoring, having favorable impressions. At the end of the year, they made a decision that if the clinic collections reached a certain goal, anything over that amount would be given to the foundation to help sponsor the museum. This source of revenue generated $25,000. Because they could not raise the funds for construction of a new building, they rented the vacated mortuary. Pledges and sponsorships for exhibits came in. Um, and so the JCs underwrote the exhibit of male and female reproductive organs. The Halstead Lions Club covered the cost to, for the testing for colorblindness. And Sir Optimus paid $14,000 for Valida. The only rural health museum in the world opened its doors to the public on August 2nd, 1965 in Halstead, Kansas, a town with a population of 1,700 people. The formal dedication day was October 10th, 1965. Valida, which in German, it stands for valid, means healthy. Um, Valida was made in West Germany. And shown here are some pictures of Valida arriving at the Health Museum, as well as one of her, um, Dr. Kinnicky with Valida when she arrived. Valida stands five foot seven and weighs 98 pounds. If she were human, she would weigh 145 pounds. The original mold was made by completely coating a 28-year-old German woman with a rubber composition, which was allowed to harden. This was then peeled off and used as the mold for Valida's plastic skin. Her skeleton is made of aluminum and is situated exactly as it would be in the normal human body. Tucked inside are her internal organs made of plastic and all are scientifically correct. More than six miles of red and blue plastic coated wire illustrates the largest of the blood vessels and nerves. Her organs were lit by 30 small lights. Belita tells a story of how her body works. All who visit the Learning Center get to learn about the human body through Belita. In 1970, a centennial celebration was held was um, held to celebrate 100 years of Dr. Hertzler's legacy. At that celebration, Milburn Stone, better known as Doc Adams from Gunsmoke, visited and signed copies of the Horse and Buggy Doctor that included a foreword by him. Milburn grew up in Burton, which is about 10 miles west of Halstead, and had strong ties to Halstead, and he remembered Dr. Hertzler from his childhood. And he's seated here next to Dr. Kinnicky. In 1970, in honor of what would have been Dr. Hertzler's 100th birthday, the stretch of Highway 89 between US 50 and Halstead was renamed the Arthur E. Hertzler Memorial Highway. Governor George Docking is presenting a commemorative roadside here to William Shockey. 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 Thank you, the, who was the executive director of the Herzl Research Foundation at that time, and Dr. Irene Kinnicky, the widow of Dr. Herzler. The early 70s brought yet another renovation, providing a facelift for offices in several of the patient areas. On the Herzler Clinic's 
um, the 73rd anniversary, they moved into a new two and a half million dollar facility. That same year, 1975, the hospital broke ground on a 15 and a half million dollar renovation and building project. This new hospital was dedicated on October 8, 1978, with approximately 2,000 visitors at the home open house. And here's an aerial view of the dedication. You can see all the people outside as it was being dedicated. The 1980s brought about a lot of significant additions to Halstead Hospital. In 1983, an outpatient guest unit opened in the hospital in the Halstead Hospital for patients undergoing diagnostic and treatment procedures. It was the first of its kind in the nation. In 1985, the hospital opened the Hospital Inn, an efficiency motel providing affordable, convenient lodging for patients and families. In 1987, the Halstead Hospital buggy van service hit the road providing transportation for both urban and rural Kansans seeking hospital care. In 1989, the Heart Vascular Catheterization Lab and the Radiation Oncology Treatment Facility opened with the new hospital addition. In October 1970, the Hertzler Research Foundation purchased the square block of the old high school and had it raised. They felt that it would be an ideal location for the development of the facilities and health education and programs of the foundation. In 1991, the Kansas Learning Center for Health was finally in a position to break ground for this new building. Dr. Stouffer, the KLCH president, um, is presiding here over the ceremony up here on the top. And then we had Senator Dole here that was a guest speaker at the ceremony. So as shown, the fruition of all the time, efforts, and obligations to get the Kansas Learning Center for Health in its current location at 505 West Main Street in Halstead. When, open, when it opened in 1992, um, KLCH included one classroom and an auditorium, along with the exhibit hall and basement. The auditorium, which features Belita, was named after the late Rhonda Stutzman, as she was a very active community supporter and worked with Bud Sloop, one of the directors here at the museum, on several projects beginning back in 1971. She passed away in a car accident in 1986, and her husband, John, um, that's been on the board for know, about 30 years, um, wanted to dedicate the auditorium to her name. The 1990s brought more significant changes to the hospital. The Sisters of St. Joseph sold Halstead Hospital to Paracelsus Healthcare Corporation in 1993. In 1995, a multi-million dollar renovation of the cardiac catheterization lab was completed. In 1996, Paracelsus Healthcare sold the hospital to Columbia HCA. And in 1999, Halstead Hospital became part of LifePoint Hospital, which was a spinoff of Columbia HCA. The hospital also acquired an open MRI unit that year. So as Becky mentioned earlier, um, Dr. Donald Decker was known as the father and founder of the Hospital Hosp Holstead Hospital Intensive Care Unit, which was established in 1969 and dedicated to him in 1995. Pictured here is Dr. Decker receiving a plaque in 2016 for serving 50 years on the Kansas Learning Center for Health Board of Trustees. KLCH began taking their health education programs on the road doing outreach in 1995. The van shown was donated in 2014 by Carmen Decker Bonanno in memory of his parents, Richard and Della Decker. In 2000, the Hertzler Research Foundation purchased Halstead Hospital, restoring its nonprofit status. The hospital and clinic were united as the Hertzler Regional Medical Center. Valley Hope Drug and Alcohol Rehabilitation opened a treatment center at the hospital. In 2001, the Halstead Hospital Center for Behavioral Health opened. Then Leslie Kitchenmaster with Peak Management purchased the medical facilities. The Hertzler Halstead Medical Complex celebrated their centennial on June 22nd, 2002. And unfortunately, just a few months later in January of 2003, all operations ceased due to financial issues and poor management. 
Despite the closure of the Herbster Halstead Medical Complex, the Kansas Learning Center for Health continues to carry out Dr. Herbster's legacy, providing health education to well over half a million visitors since it opened in 1965. In the early 2000s, KLCH um, received some new exhibits from, and I say new, new to us exhibits from the Cleveland Museum. And the exhibits were free. They were no, no longer using them. We just had to pay for shipping, um, which we had a board member do so. And since then, we've continued to update and refurbish them, keeping them current and in good working condition. And they are centered around the five senses. Here you can see the sight, touch, smell, and hearing um, exhibits. We also had a new heart exhibit that was purchased as a part of the expansion. It was over $40,000. Um, and shown here is it closed when we received it in 2013. And then here we have it opened, um, which is how it's normally seen. So you can see inside of it, um, and it has a nice visual for people when they come in. An expansion took place in 2013, and in 2014, the Bailey Annex opened, included a third classroom, a boardroom, kitchen, bathroom, storage room, two-car garage, and an elevator. There are only two Belitas still working in the United States, and the one in Halstead is still looking good after 55 years. The other Belita is located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Technology has allowed us to produce three different scripts for various ages that are shown on a TV while she lights up. Everyone that visits the Learning Center, whether with a school group or just in for a self-guided tour, gets to enjoy seeing Belita. Some people even just drive through town and want to come in and just, just to see her. And here's a snapshot of the exhibit hall today. It's a very colorful, um, which has changed. Back in the early 90s, it was um, more gray and white. And so over the years, we've added a lot of color to it to make it exciting for the students. And then we've added some other exhibits like Charlie Bones. Um, we have a real skeleton that the students can see with some other skeleton or bones that they can build their own. Um, and then we have all of our exhibits are very tactile so that the students can play with them and learn as they are playing. 17 various health education programs are taught today at the Kansas Learning Center for Health. They range for all ages, pre-K up to college. Programs are on um, all of the body systems, on dental, drug prevention, and our most popular classes are puberty and human reproduction. Um, we teach over 100 puberty and human reproduction classes each year. It's our most popular one. Um, the elementary programs that we do also include hands-on activities, as of their um, as part of their educational experience, we've seen 15 to 16,000 students each year, having taught over half a million since we opened our doors. And as you can imagine, with the pandemic that we're going through, um, unfortunately, we will not be serving many students here in our facility, um, in our center. We have moved and are moving um, our programming at, to become a virtual experience for students, similar to like what we're doing today. So. Um, we are making that change, and we know we'll only have just a few schools that we'll actually be able to attend here in person this year. We've added some newer exhibits recently. Um, in 2017, this Kids Fun Corner um, was built, and it's designed for kids under the age of six. And then in 2018, we installed a digestive exhibit. Um, the students get to insert a scarf into the mouth of this, and it shoots out through the top. And the kids really, I say kids, kids and adults really enjoy um, getting to play with the digestive exhibit. And then new just this year, we built a community herb garden in a pavilion back in June. This was done through um, some grants and partnerships, sponsorships to make it happen. Um, it is available for the community to utilize. People can come and pick herbs. Um, and we do hope to expand that to offer some vegetables um, for next year. And then we also have a farm to family exhibit that we just opened this month. Um, this is kind of a view from a distance and this is a little bit of a close up view, but it has um, our far farmers co-op in there, Cargill operation, um, kind of a miniature um, downtown farms. Um, there's a variety of things in there. We've had a lot of um, 
different grants that we wrote and different people that are sponsoring this, different foundations. Um, so it's been a huge effort by the community to put this together. And it basically is going to show the process in which um, food gets from the farm to a student's table. Um, we serve a lot of students from the Wichita area, and many of them um, think their milk just comes from the grocery store. And so we want to show them the correct process. Um, we're super excited to have this exhibit. It's just unfortunate that it happens to be during the pandemic. And so um, not as many will get to see it in person this year, but hopefully next year we can have more students get to interact with it. We also have an iron lung here at the Learning Center that is quite a historical piece. And I'm gonna turn the computer over to Dr. Decker and he's gonna talk a little bit about um, polio, the vaccine, um, kind of some of that stuff as we go. I'm going to turn that to you. There. Good afternoon. Um, it's kind of interesting to compare the present pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, to, uh, to polio. There are a number of uh, similarities and a number of differences. Some of the uh, similarities are both of them have the capacity of spreading panic when an epidemic appears and both of them have many asymptomatic cases. During the polio epidemic, we didn't really know about how many asymptomatic cases there were. We thought that everybody, any, if you, if you develop polio, you would have some degree of paralysis. However, we later learned that when there was an epidemic of polio in a community, most of the population of that community ended up having antibodies meaning they had had polio and didn't know it. Now, one of the big differences is polio affected mostly children. It was known as also known as infantile paralysis. And COVID-19, as you know, affects mostly uh, elderly people or most of the deaths are in elderly people. Um, some of the prominent people that had polio was uh, President Roosevelt, who had it in 1921, but kind of reviewing the epidemics of polio, the first epidemic in the United States was in 1894, and there was really no treatment for it. The first treatment really that there was a value was the development of the iron lung, which occurred in 1929, and it acted by breathing for the patient. Now, the main way that polio killed people was, <coughs> excuse me, it paralyzed the uh, respiratory muscles. Um, when it paralyzed the legs and arms, uh, they didn't die. But if the respiratory lung uh, muscles were paralyzed, the person might be unable to breathe and die. And that was the main way that it was, was uh, uh, fatal. Uh, it's interesting that it took a long time to develop a vaccine for polio. Um, it took about 50 years, really, since the first epidemic was in 1894, and the first vaccine was developed in the early 1950s. The first vaccine was a killed virus, the so-called Salk virus, and Dr. Salk gave this to himself and to his family. <coughs> Excuse me to uh, prove that it was safe and it proved generally safe, except there were several companies that made the vaccine. And in 1955, the so-called Cutter incident occurred, in which case there were quite a few children that developed paralysis after the vaccine was given. It was a so-called kill virus, but the Cutter pharmaceutical company had a technique for killing the virus that wasn't completely effective and some of them um, resulted in live vaccine. Later, an oral vaccine, which was a live virus, an attenuated, weakened virus, and uh, it, it has proven very, uh, very safe and very uh, effective. Uh, just remembering some of the things that happened during the polio vaccine that, that I remember, um, they they would close the swimming pools, the theaters. Uh, most of the epidemics occurred during the summer and they might delay the start of school, but they didn't 
have a widespread shutdown such as we have now and nobody wore a mask, we didn't use masks, um, some people kind of self-isolated and stayed home because they were afraid to go out. But there was quite a different response to it compared to, uh, to, the, to the present response. Dr. Decker, I, yeah. I have a question for you. And forgive me for interrupting, but we're almost close to 2 o'clock. But I wanted to ask a question. Dr. Mm -hmm. Ertzler certainly became a prominence um, easily around the 19 teens, 20s, 30s, that kind of thing. At that same time, Dr. John Romulus Brinkley um, is famous in Kansas for his uh, goat gland transplants. And you also have the Minninger family who is rising to prominence. Did they ever have any interactions that you may know of? I mean, I know you came along a lot long, lot, you know, many years after, but in terms of researching history or any of those, was there ever any interactions that you guys are aware of? You know, I'm really not aware of, of that there was much uh, interaction. Uh, those many nurse and Brinkley were certainly the other Kansas physicians who became quite uh, prominent, and, and, and that's interesting. Uh, Interesting on, on sort of a different but related subject, the uh, Halstead Historical Society has a letter from Dr. Einstein to Dr. Herzler, so he did have some contact with with Dr. Einstein. Well, uh, and as you know, you may know, um, there was a physician that uh, uh, performed the autopsy on Dr. Einstein. Uh, when he passed away in 1955, 56, somewhere around there, the doctor comes to Kansas. He lives in Wichita for a while and stores Einstein's brain in a Tupperware container. And uh, there's a wonderful book out uh, called Driving Mr. Einstein's Brain, I think is the name of it. But it's um, the trip coming to Kansas. Um, but Dr. Um, and, and Carrie, uh, I hope it's okay. Is it all right if we take a small break and would you be available just for a few minutes afterwards to answer any questions that some of our group may have? Yes, we can be. Um, this was going to be like our last slide anyway. So this was perfect timing. Um, Excellent. this is a picture from, um, residents in protection, Kansas, in protection, Kansas they were in line to receive the polio vaccinations at their um, high school gym back in 1957. So um, this was really the end of our presentation and um, just sharing that we, you know, Vernon Center continues to be the legacy for Dr. Hertzler. So yeah, we will, um, I, do you want me to go ahead and stop sharing my screen? Is that okay? It, it doesn't matter. That would be fine. That would be fine. And for those of you in class, let's take a small break and come back and, uh, Online, it'll only be a few minutes, so we'll get back as soon as we can. Thank you so much. You did great, both of you. Thank you. I'm going to grab my charger for my phone. Mm -hmm. Wait, wait, wait. Wait. Yeah, having that running.
So do any of you have any questions for Carrie or Dr. Decker? Yes, Marie, step to the mic. Carrie. I'm trying to keep the sequence of events in my head, but if you could help me. First, there was a Hertzler Hospital. Then they sold to the Sisters of St. Joe, who then lo later sold it to numerous other companies. Then the Hertzler Clinic bought the hospital back. Am I remembering? Dr. Decker, are you there? Yes. No, it, it wasn't the Hertzler so Clinic that bought back. It was the Kansas, actually the Hertzler Research Foundation, which owned the Kansas Learning Center for Health. I have a follow-up oh, question. So this, um, the Kansas Learning Center for Health was one of the branches of the Herschel Research Foundation. And the Herschel Research Foundation bought the, ho the hospital and the clinic back for a very brief period of time. They bought both the hospital and clinic, which by then were combined into one. So what is it now? The hospital. Now, now we're at the Kansas Learning Center for Health. Okay. And, and the hospital closed. no longer exists. Okay. It's been closed. It's and been the hosp closed hospital and clinic are both closed. Yeah. I'll turn it over to Carrie. Yeah, they closed in January 2003, and so they've been vacant since then. Okay. A follow-up question. Do you know anything about the Hertzler descendants? There is a Dr. William Hertzler in Wichita who's a dentist. Would he be any relation? Do we know about? I don't think not, so. Not to my knowledge. 
not to our knowledge, um, there are some of the Heberts, um, like great grandsons that are what up in Minnesota um, and stuff, but I don't know what relations. I know there's some other Hertzlers nearby too, and I'm not sure if they're cousins or what, but they're not directly. They're not direct. Right. Thank you. Excellent. Any other questions? Yes. We have oodles of questions. Mm -hmm. I don't really have a question, but uh, my grandfather uh, died of cancer in, in his early 50s. And uh, in the 19, early 30s, he went to Mayo Clinic and they couldn't find out what was wrong with him. So he went to the Hertzler Clinic. And I don't know who examined him, uh, but uh, they did a rectal exam and found out he had a tumor. And uh, it was too large to do surgery. But uh, anyway, uh, the Hertzler Clinic found if he'd gone there earlier, maybe he would have uh, survived, but uh, he died in his early 50s and the early 30s. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Any other questions or comments? Oh, good. We have, we have more coming in. Um, this is wonderful. Did you tell the story? You guys struck our curiosity. Yeah, I can't remember. My, my grandmother died in 1946 at Halstead Hospital. I was born in 48, so all I know is what my mother told me. She said, Grace disease runs in my dad's family. So she had a goiter that came clear down to almost to her waist by the time she went to get help at Halstead Hospital. And uh, my mother said she was a little bit down the hall from the room and uh, I guess they'd taken the goiter out, but she heard two nurses talking, and they said that woman in there is full of cancer. So I don't, don't know what which killed her, the cancer or the goiter. But it did say he collected the goiters and mm -hmm. saved them. To, are they still around? Um, I don't know what happened with all of that, but yes, he did save everything. <laughs> I have another story about Dr. Herster. There was a patient here who needed an operation, and uh, she said that she wanted to go to a bigger place. She wasn't going to have her operation at little old Halstead, so she went either to the Mayo Clinic or the KU Med Center, yeah. and she was there getting ready to be operated on, and she looked up, and there was Dr. Hertzler was going to do the operation. He said it would have only cost you a hundred dollars in Halstead, but it's going to cost you a thousand dollars here. It's the power of small town living, isn't it? <laughs> All right, we've got another question coming up. So, Dr. Hertzler, he would take the train back and forth, apparently, between KU and and home. That's probably why he had to sleep that way. <laughs> Yes. You got too used to it. Okay. I can't imagine what his schedule was like going back and forth so much. <laughs> it's amazing he survived. Yeah. Long as <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, you said he did all kinds of surgery. Did he also do orthopedic surgery? Um, I think so. He, he even did yeah. some neurosurgery. You know, now. Yeah. I was going to ask that too. Yeah. yeah. Yes, We're specialized did. now. So. Of course, the amount of neurosurgery done then was somewhat limited, but uh, right. he did some. It probably was most of the result of trauma, hematomas, and things like that. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Any other questions or comments? Well, Carrie and Dr. Decker, I want to thank you so much for doing this. You did it at the last minute and you did a rock star presentation. So please, you guys, let's thank them for coming. I so appreciate it. I owe you big time. Thank you so much. You guys take care. Bye-bye. Right, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of public health in Kansas. 
and how that's kind of developed through the years. And some of you certainly may know far more than I do. And I truly would welcome any input that you have, that kind of thing. But as I was preparing for this class, I thought of a couple of, of things. Um, I thought, of, of course, of Dr. Samuel Crumbine, who we talked about in that first class, and how, you know, he would probably recognize the precautions that some of his fellow Kansans are now uh, taking to avoid the coronavirus. He no doubt um, would approve of, of some of the, the closings that we've had and the cautious reopenings. He'd worry about Kansas hospitals and their staff and if they were truly prepared for a crisis. Um, but mostly he'd be perplexed at once again, how could he help make the public take seriously the threat of a global pandemic? Um, it was 102 years ago that Crumbine, a public health reformer and executive officer of the Kansas State Board of Health, faced down a world pandemic that started in Kansas, the 1918 flu epidemic. At the turn of the 20th century, he had public health campaigns that encouraged Kansans to swat the fly in combating the spread of diseases. He had the phrase, don't spit on the sidewalk, emblazoned on, on bricks, and encouraged the replacement of the common drinking cups on railroads and in public buildings with paper cups. I interviewed a couple of months ago Marilyn Irvin Holt, who's a United States historian and is based in Abilene and the author of several books and articles. And she's often a consultant for PBS documentaries. And she said, if you're talking about Crumbine, then you realize he was a very, very early leader in public health, not just in Kansas, but nationally. The 1918 flu epidemic began in Western Kansas and was carried by men reporting for duty at Fort Riley. And it soon spread worldwide in three distinct waves during 1918, even up until 1919, causing more than 50 million deaths and infecting nearly a third of the world's population. Because of Crumbine and a legion of public health nurses who helped champion public health, Kansas at the turn of the late 19th century and early 20th century was one of the leading states in the nation. The progressive movement that swept across Kansas um, and simply put, progressives believe that if one applied science and scientific methods, you could solve any of their problems, of life's problems. If you show people a different way of doing things, if you change their habits with something as simple as don't spit on the sidewalk, you can change their habits, and then you are improving society, Holt said. You can do that in all walks of life. It leads over to teaching home economics. You teach a woman to be a scientific housekeeper, a scientific cook, and you are not only going to improve the family's way of life, you're going to basically improve the woman's life as well. How many of you remember going through home economic classes? Yes! You know, and for boys it was shop and all those kind of things. That was all part of that movement. Um, and so I think that's just interesting that it stuck around. Um, and of course, as Dr. Decker mentioned, it, um, in April of 1957, the town of protection in Comanche County out in western Kansas became the first community in the nation to rally against polio. Dave Webb, a good friend of mine, is a Kansas historian and a retired assistant director of the Kansas Heritage Center in Dodge City. And he was only eight years old um, when the Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, as Dr. Decker said, later known as the March of Dimes, came to protection. 
And he said they staged some events and took newsreel footage of it and used it in a national campaign to say that everyone in protection is protected against polio. Why, you should be too. There was a barbecue and a town parade, and Dave Webb remembers riding on a float dressed as a pioneer boy. I know that ABC ran a segment about it on the evening news and I was playing outside and my mom yelled, come in quick. And I didn't come in very quickly. And when I got there, she said, well, you were just on the evening news. They had a clip of the parade and showed the, the float I was riding on. I was crushed when I missed my TV debut. Isn't that a hoot? I can't you see that happening. <laughs> um, and as Dr. Decker mentioned, it was a time when swimming pools were closed. Um, watermelon was avoided. Do you guys remember this? I do. Um, children were encouraged to play only on their neighborhood blocks and all the hopes in all of avoiding polio. Um, those kind of things. Um, you know, it's been interesting to see how Kansas has responded um, to the pandemic. I mean, one of the things early on we saw was like Boot Hill Distillery in Dodge City began making and giving away free hand sanitizer. Some people put stuffed... Um, toy bears in their windows so children could um, ride by and, and see kind of little signs of, of fun stuff to do. And I know like in my hometown, they uh, decided one evening to drive around the square and honk at each other. It's what people do in small towns. I'm just going to say that. Um, but um, just some of those things. Um, so anyway, um, wanted to maybe look at how Kansas has responded to things um, through the years um, and some of the remedies that people have come up with. Um, I was looking on um, the uh, Kansas Historical Society for some of those things, and I noticed the Wakanda Springs jug, and Wakanda Springs... Um, was um, a place in uh, kind of north central Kansas uh, that was known, um, it was kind of by Cocker City, but it was known as a springs that claimed it could cure whatever ailed a person. And um, for years, Indians, um, before the settlement of uh, European uh, homesteaders, they would look at that site as a sacred site. And it uh, was like a limestone formation that went up several feet in the air and spring water would trickle out. And they would leave offerings. And several tribes, native tribes, um, believed that it had sacred waters. But as the um, European... Uh, American settlement began, uh, someone had the idea of maybe they could turn that into a uh, health sanatorium and they would bottle the water. And they would say that it was based on the legends. And it's, it's a really bad legend, but it's kind of filtered through the decades of where these young lovers were were separated and uh, they ended up jumping into the springs and were forever in love in the springs type of thing. Kind of cheesy. It's been used in many themes throughout, um, well, throughout our nation, actually. Um, but anyway, people believed in the power of those spring waters. Um, and it... Uh, is now covered over. Uh, it was, uh, is it, what lake is it that now is on where the, pardon? 
Glenn Elder, thank you so much. I appreciate that. But yes, it is. It has been covered over by the lake, and it is is part of that. Another resource that I looked at for doing this this uh, class today was it's a now out of print book, um, but you can um, you can access it online, and it was done by the. Um, Kansas Nurses Association. It was published in 1942. It's called Lamps on the Prairie. I take it as an excellent resource because one of the people who helped put it together was my great aunt Irma Law. Uh, she was the superintendent of nursing at Wesley Hospital here in Wichita, and she went on to help write some of the uh, Kansas regulations for nursing. Um, in like the 1930s and 40s. Um, but um, one of the things it talks about is how we have had somewhat of an awareness for public health, uh, even dating back to when Coronado came to Kansas in 1541, um, that he had a physician, Coronado, the Spanish conquistador, had a physician that accompanied him and that Yusipti, one of the Indians that um, he was Quivirin, who helped lead Quivira and his men into Kansas, um, taught them to use dock root for diarrhea, coffee bean root for constipation, milkweed for dysentery, slippery elm bark as a laxative, and foxglove for chills and fever. I thought that was interesting. I don't know. I thought that was just kind of intriguing there. Um, Lewis and Clark, they uh, wrote in their journals when they came, um, part of their journey came in through Kansas. It's like 126, 127 miles that they traversed through Kansas. And they talk about how... Um, they treated one of the men in the expedition. This would have been probably by Atchison um, on July 4th, 1804, while they were camped at the mouth of the Independence Creek in Kansas. They named it that. Uh, one of the men was bitten by a snake, but a poultice of bark and gunpowder was sufficient to cure the wound. And some of you may have memories of your family <laughs> maybe using different uh, home remedies for things. I I know um, I had an uncle that swore that if he blew smoke into your ear, it would cure earache. Um, you know, um, malaria was sometimes something that um, uh, troubled people of the 19th century. Smallpox, um, they believe that it was first brought into Kansas in 1828 by the fish band of the Shawnee who had contracted the disease from white men while on their way from Ohio. And uh, that uh, the Indians plunged themselves into cold water uh, to uh, relieve the fever and itching and many died, like thousands. Um, probably hundreds, um, in terms of in Kansas here. Um, originally estimated at 25,000, their number was reduced in the years from 1831 to 1855 by approximately half. And other tribes were similarly affected. Measles was also new to the Indians. The Wyandots, who were forced uh, from Ohio in 1843, 43 contracted measles in Cincinnati and lost nearly half their young children from the disease uh, during their first year in Kansas. John Dunbar, for whom um, some of you may have watched Dances with Wolves starring Kevin Costner when it came out in the early 1990s, he um, actually was a real person who lived among the Indians and was from Kansas, and he recorded accounts of that um, as well um, in his journals. Um, and if any of you have any household 
uh, remedies, feel free to come up here and offer them. I'm always intrigued by them. Uh, so feel free to do that. Um, when uh, women would come to Kansas, many of the early homesteaders, they would bring with them cook cookbooks and household um, items that they were given instructions on how they could prepare herbal and other doses. Um, a chess poultice um, always um, helped, uh, it, the belief was to cure the common cold. Um, gargle, gargling was used, um, usually hot salt water. Some of us may still do that, I don't know. Um, if pneumonia developed, uh, they resorted to a poultice of fried onions placed on the chest and a bag of hot hops on the abdomen. I don't know. Would that work? <laughs> um, let's see. Red flannel, the material, was uh, used for uh, application of heat. Red was a symbol of fire. Therefore, it must be warmer than white material. And if it was dipped in hot turpentine, it could be used for all kinds of stomach pains. Uh, old burns. Um, sometimes a poultice was made out. I am not making this up. Chicken droppings um, that were dipped into a pot of boiling water and then kind of strained and used as a batter um, to put over the burns. Um, at the same time, there were some Kansans who believed that actually it was better to just suffer through um, that they kind of gloried in their own misery. Um, it was evil to pamper the body um, and uh, I'm just sometimes grateful I live now. I don't know. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I know my great, my grandmother on my mom's side would sometimes talk about how when she was a kid, they would use a chicken manure, no, excuse me, sheep manure, um, herbal tea, uh, to drink. Yes, don't doesn't that just make you kind of ee? Oh good, we have a question coming up. I mean yes. they put they put it in all kinds of stuff commercially now, but that started by plants that pat people passed around with each other. I think my grandma probably had had those. Probably got that from her family. Absolutely. Yeah. That's an excellent one. Okay. Any of you recall any other <laughs> remedies? Well, this is a prohibition class. You've talked about how they put a lot of alcohol in things and you got it at the pharmacy. Yes. But all the cough syrups and stuff had a lot of alcohol. Yes. <laughs> that could cure what ailed you. We had public, oh, Kill, come on, come up. We had public health um, in many ways, even dating back to when we became a territory in 1854. Yes, step right on up. Well, I'm not from Kansas, but uh, I stayed with my grandparents that were from Tennessee in Oklahoma. And every spring you had to drink sassafras tea to detox. And then if you had a cold, sore throat or whatever, grandma always made uh, a whorehound candy. So that was all we did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you mentioned chest poultice. I can remember my mother putting hot mustard plaster on my chest if I had a cold. I'm wondering if there's a book out that says which folk medicines worked, 
which I would love to know if you find one or if anyone knows one. I think that would be fascinating. Well, and of course, when I was growing up, if we did have a bad cough, it was mentholatum, and you'd put it on a wash rag and then put it on your chest. That's what we did. It's scary, but I'm a true believer in the power of mentholatum. The, yes. Years ago, uh, young mothers used paragoric when their babies were teething. And then it was, what, admitted or discovered that it was quite a strong narcotic. Then you had to get a prescription. Then it dropped out of favor. Well, I was a mental item child too. <laughs> <laughs> um, my great 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 grandfather graduated from Fairfield Medical College in New York and it's a little tiny town and of course it's not there anymore and they moved to Kansas in the 1850s and he was started out as a medical doctor but he became a holistic doctor in Lawrence and uh, he and his son started uh, the Kansas Holistic Medical Society Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. You guys have some good stuff here. My mother was big on castor oil to keep you regular. And uh, then my first husband's grandmother was half Cherokee. She said that they would drink a sassafras tea to thin their blood for the summer. That's, that's wonderful. Well, you know, one of the things I've, I've found is that, you know, as counties became organized, they eventually did develop the need for public health. And it was not uncommon um, if there were a measles outbreak, cholera, that communities, individual communities would be shut down or even individual households put in quarantine if um, there was the belief that they may affect, that the members of those houses might affect other members of the community. Um, one of my favorite characters in Kansas history is Emily Morgan, who um, grew up um, in Butler County on a little farm near Leon. Uh, she became a public health nurse here in Wichita. She was one of the first here in Wichita during World War I. Um, she served in France um, with the American Red Cross and uh, actually was fairly close, I believe, to some of the, the fighting and that kind of thing. She came back to Kansas, and after the war, um, she was sent to Alaska. And because of her, she is actually the one. There was a doctor in Fairbanks, but according to her accounts, he was somewhat of an alcoholic and not quite up to snuff. She had had diphtheria here in Wichita and had survived it, so she knew the signs of it. And she actually was the one who diagnosed that the community um, could easily have an epidemic and that they needed uh, the vaccine and they were low on the vaccine and what vaccine was there was old. And so she is the one who, who in many ways inspired the Iditarod race that still continues today. But the only way that uh, the community could be reached was... Um, by dog sled. And so I love her story. And of course, radio announcers of the day called her the angel of the Yukon, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, but anyway, we have people throughout Kansas history that have helped um, bring awareness, who have helped um, our um, state as a whole to become healthier. Um, and I just feel like it's worth noting um, how Kansas has really, in many ways, often been on the leading forefront of, um, 
of um, just in terms of, of health and awareness, that kind of thing. Um, any questions or comments? Yes, feel free to come on up or if you want to shout it out, do. Did every small town have a doctor? Well, part of becoming a civilized community was having a doctor. Not every town did, and certainly now um, as rural Kansans um, go, go forward, um, there are not always enough doctors to go around. Um, often they are faced with having to go into larger communities and traveling quite a while to get um, medical treatment. I hope that was a good answer, is it? For those of you who have been in, in health and medicine and nursing, what are your thoughts? Do you have any? All right. Any other questions or comments? Well, you guys, I have enjoyed today's class. And next week, we'll be talking with Chris Green from the Kansas Leadership Center. We'll be looking at what's happened in terms of just some of these movements and how they relate in terms of journalism and what issues are facing Kansans now and how we can go about being leaders in our communities. Probably far more than we'll be able to handle, but I think it'll be a fun class. All right, look forward to it next week. You guys have a good week. Thank <laughs> you.